Hi everyone and welcome to this knowledge clip on theories of international migration. This time I will be talking about uh, migration transition theories which have become much more popular over the past years to explain why international migration exists. So here we have a much more contemporary migration theory compared to more classical migration theories like the neoclassical theory, the push-pull model, the new economics of migration, labor market segmentation approaches or uh, structuralist approaches, which you might have already uh, watched in the other knowledge clips that uh, have been recorded. If you did not do so, uh, please um, do so because this is relevant uh, background material. But so migration transition theories, they kind of get into a different direction. And why is that? Well, because these previous classical theories, they start from the idea that migration and development tend to be kind of linear, right? So the more developed a country becomes, the less likely it is, for example, that people do uh, migrate out of that country. Now migration transition theories argue that this is actually much more complex and that we should fundamentally consider the relationship between development and international migration as a non-linear uh, relationship. And what does that mean? Well basically it means that um, when people are poor so that means on the graph that you see here uh, next to me, when you are at the left side of the graph, you see that migration is low and development is low. Why is that the case? Because people, if they live in poor societies, are very unlikely to have sufficient financial resources to migrate. Um, this is sometimes called the poverty constraint, which kind of forces them sometimes to stay in the country of origin. And the more developed the country becomes, as you can also see in the graph, the more developed the country becomes, the more people will start to emigrate from that country. And that is, of course, because the financial uh, possibilities, for example, among others, of people will increase with development. And so migration transition theories in that sense are reacting also against this very popular idea sometimes in politics, but sometimes you also see that in the news, um, the idea that if you send development aid to countries of origins, that that will kind of curb international migration. What we actually see in the figure is that this won't happen because the more a country develops, the more people will eventually migrate until a certain tipping point when a country is sufficiently developed and when uh, immigration will go down. And you see with immigration, we see a different uh, graph emerging here, namely uh, poorly developed countries do not have a lot of immigration and the more a country gets developed, the more migration you get towards the country as well. So on the macro level, we do see this kind of pattern and that explains also why, for example, we do not have a mass migration from people from, let's say, Malawi, because that's a very poor uh, country and uh, the people there do not have the capacities or the financial capacity very often to move. And that is why we see that many migrants today are originating from middle-income countries. Think about Turkey, think about China, uh, India, uh, Mexico, uh, Brazil, for example, where we see a much higher rate of out-migration because these countries are already much more developed. Now, the migration transition theory in its classical form has been formulated already in the 70s by Zelinsky, a demographer. But lately, uh, since 2010, there has been a couple of scholars, particularly Jürgen Karling and Hande Haas, who further worked on the migration transitions theories, particularly to explain the micro-level mechanism behind the general pattern. And so what they say is that actually we should consider that for people, once they are in the migration decision-making process, there's two different things that we need to think about. On the one hand, we need to think about the capabilities of people and on the other hand we have to think about their aspirations. Now when we talk about capability we can define this uh, in line with Sen as um, the ability of human beings to lead the lives they have reason to value and to enhance the substantive choices that people have. So if you, ha if you are capable um, to, uh, to move to another place that's already something eh, compared to people who do not have that capacity. 
But so they argue that with development, with the more developed the country becomes, the more the capabilities of people increase, but also the more that their aspirations increase. That might be a little bit lower, slower, as you can see in the graph uh, next to me, the capabilities compared to the aspirations, but still you see the migration aspirations and the capabilities, they do uh, increase together with the level of development. So how does that work? Basically, these scholars, they argue that when people, for example, uh, live in a developing country, there is development aid uh, and there is more education being offered to people. That means that many more people in the country of origin, in that specific country, will have access or will have views on what is happening outside of their own community, outside of their own country. So they're much more exposed to alternative lifestyles, which can influence their aspirations, right? And the, the ideas on what the good life exactly is. And that explains, for example, why we see rural Morocco, uh, that despite the fact that it has been developing consistently over the years, that we still see many people that have uh, aspirations to move abroad because the capabilities, they do not uh, increase as fast as their aspirations. The same, there is a study by uh, Shul in rural Ethiopia, which also shows that with the more educated the people become, the more the aspirations to move abroad um, actually increase, whereas the capabilities linked to development do increase much uh, slower. And that explains why we see so much migration then from a developing country, because with development, you increase the aspirations and lately also the capabilities, which means that people uh, with development will also be much more likely or tend to move uh, abroad or internationally. And that leads them to this figure again. So that's the first figure uh, that I also already showed, uh, which shows that the relationship between development and migration is really non-linear. So that this idea that there is a linear relationship, which implicitly is the idea behind the classical migration theories, that that simply is not true. Now, uh, together, uh, Jorgen Karling and Han de Haas, they made uh, this matrix, which put together the migration capabilities and the migration aspirations of people, indicating whether they are high or whether they are low. And then they allowed to classify international migration into four different forms. So you have, for example, um, low migration capabilities, with uh, low migration aspirations, uh, high migration aspirations, that leads to involuntary immobility, which means that some people, they really want to move, but they're not capable to do so. Um, think about Malawi again, for example, people might have an idea, okay, I want to move to, um, to a developed country, but actually they do not have the capability, so that means involuntary uh, immobility. They have to stay where they are. At the same time, you can also have, of course, that people do have a lot of migration capabilities and they do have high migration aspirations. And then we get into most forms of international migration, namely voluntary mobility. Next to this, we can also classify here, and that is interesting because Many of the earlier theories really focused on economic migration, but their conceptualization also allows to uh, put forced migration somewhere in, namely people who have low migration aspirations, so they generally were not uh, kind of um, aiming to move, but they have capabilities, uh, then you become involuntary mobile, for example, right? Because you have to move, you have the capabilities, you do not want to, but moving, of course, is a better option than staying, and that leads then to involuntary uh, mobility. And then there is a final form of mobility, which they uh, call uh, acquiescent immobility, which means simply that people have low migration aspirations and they have also low uh, migration capabilities. And that then leads to a situation where they also uh, keep in the uh, place where they are uh, rooted. So this is migration transitions theory and the aspirations capabilities model in a nutshell. I hope you enjoyed this video.